Enrique. Hey, congratulations on pristine seas. Thank you so much. Geek or jig? How do you pronounce gig. your name? Gig. 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 And you have a nice sweater, by the way. Well, this? <laughs> From National Geographic. <laughs> awesome. Hey, so, um, so why did you want to get involved with, the, with a documentary for pristine seas for National Geographic? Well, it's not that we want to get involved. We have been working on Pristine Seas for uh, 12 years now. And we've produced 28 films. But this is a, kind of a retrospective of 10 years of work visiting some of the most remote and wild places in the ocean from the Arctic to Antarctica, through coral reefs, kelp forests. So it's been quite a journey. So, so tell me 12 years ago, how did this all started for you? Because I understand you were a college professor at one point. <laughs> yes, I was, I'm a recovering academic, actually. Uh, I used to be a professor at the University of California in, in San Diego. And my job was to study the impacts of humans in the ocean, the impacts of fishing, climate change, and, and write papers just describing how we were killing ocean life throughout the world. So. I felt like, wow, all I'm doing is write the obituary of the ocean with more and more data, more and more precision. So I felt like the doctor who's telling you how you're going to die with excruciating detail, but not offering a cure. So that day I realized to quit my job as an academic and I came to National Geographic to propose uh, the Pristine Seas Project to work on the cure. I said, let's go to the wildest places in the ocean. Let's do scientific research to show how healthy they are. Let's film, they produce films, and let's convince the people living in these countries to protect them in large national parks in the sea before it's too late. That is terrific. That's a terrific story because uh, I graduated from UC San Diego myself, ah. not not uh, University of San Diego, and um, and there and there's great professors there that uh, study oceanographies too. So. <laughs> Yeah, I was at the Scripps Institution of Oceanography in La Jolla. And, you know, it was not easy. And some of my colleagues are still scratching their heads. Why would you leave such a fantastic academic job? I had an office with these huge windows overlooking the Pacific Ocean. You know, we could go surfing every day. But it was just, I wasn't fulfilled with my life. I, I had this frustration that, am I going to just be the one who tells everybody how we're killing the ocean? Or am I going to do something about it? So... Where did you actually start with your Pristine Seas project? Because obviously you have, you have to fundraise. It's, 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 it's quite an embarkment and quite an adventure itself just, just to do that. It was an adventure because, you know, I was, trained, I was trained as a scientist, right? And I had experience fundraising because I had to raise funds for, for my research. So that was, a, that was a plot that I had been able to raise funds from private foundations and wealthy individuals who were, were passionate about the ocean. But... I had no idea about media or film production. I didn't have experience in policy, convincing government leaders to protect places. Uh, I didn't know about the, the basic economics and how can we reconcile the exploitation of the, uh, the ocean with protection. So I had to learn all of that. The good thing is that when I offered to National Geographic to do this together, at least National Geographic uh, had the experience, of course, on, on, on the filmmaking, right? So it was an adventure because I had to re-educate myself. I had to learn all these things that I needed to be a successful uh, conservationist. But, you know, it's been 12 years. We've had to protect 23 of the largest marine reserves on the planet. And that those cover an area that is over half the size of the United States. So it's been... a uh, it was a steep learning curve in the beginning, but we built together a team, that, that, a fantastic team of, of obsessed divers, scientists, filmmakers, educators, communications people who want to see our nature protected so it can help us. So it's been, it's been a fantastic journey and we're planning to continue for 10 more years. Wow. So um, how did you prioritize your locations? Did you basically first chose the most important locations and and now you're going to the ones that are less important or you basically chose it based on geographics you know that's a that's a, a, a great question because you know today only seven percent of the ocean is protected and the science is telling us that we need at least 30 percent 
of the ocean protected. So it is a lot of ocean that still, still needs to be protected. And at this point, any protected place, you know, is better than, than what we have now, right? But we have conducted scientific research that shows that there are some areas that are more important for, for marine life where marine life is more at, at risk. But also there are areas that are still near pristine. So we need to save them, keep them wild before it's too late. So we have this list, a long list of places that are either wild or they are threatened that we need to bring back. But then we, uh, you know, every plan, like Mike Tyson said, you know, every plan works until you get the punch in the mouth, right? So, you know, then we have our list, but you know, maybe the country number one has a government that is not pro-environment. So what do we do? And then we have political opportunities, like you know, a, a good administration in one country that is more uh, environmentalist. So you know, we have our long list, and, and where, how do we decide where we go next will depend on the likelihood of getting that place protected under the current uh, socio-political uh, circumstances. So when you make these films, who who do you expect to actually watch it? Do you expect like a common person like myself to watch it? Or are you trying to aim it um, much higher? Yeah, well, both actually, because we, we want to do two things. One is we want to share with the world through our National Geographic channels, the beauty of these places. We want to show to people what the ocean used to be like and what the ocean of the future could be like. But also sometimes we have an audience of one. You know, we want the president of the country or the minister of the environment or, or the local community. We want the key decision maker to fall in love with that place and, and be convinced because of that beauty, that emotional connection, be convinced that that place need, needs to be saved. So that these are the two oceans, uh, the two audiences that we target. That's, that's terrific. But how, how does a common person like myself, how, how can I contribute? You know, I'm, I'm, I'm hundreds of miles away from the ocean itself. Well, because everything is connected. The, what we do on the land, affects the ocean. You know, all the pollution from the ocean, most of, most of the pollution comes from the land actually. And then what we, the, our pollution in the atmosphere that increases the temperature of the air also increases the temperature of the water. So everything is connected. So the best thing you can do for the ocean and for the planet in general on, in, in inland is eat less meat and more vegetables. And I'm going to explain why, because you know, we eat too much meat. And meat is the least efficient way of producing food because it takes so much land. You know, growing livestock takes so much more land than growing plants. We don't need so much meat on our diets. We can get all of those proteins and nutrients from plants. So if we had a plant-based diet, we would get all the nutrients, calories, and proteins we need. And maybe you can eat some meat here and there, but that also means that we would need much less land to produce the food that we eat. We, we would need half of the land that we use today. So we could bring some of that land back to nature, back to wild. And we know that when we have healthy places, healthy habitat, like f uh, mature forests or ground, grasslands or wetlands or, or ocean ecosystems, nature captures much more of our carbon pollution from the atmosphere, which also helps to slow uh, the warming of the planet. So there you go. If everybody had a plant-based diet, you'd be better for our health and for the health of the planet. I think that's actually great advice. Um, during your during your twelve year journey, you have made a lot of accomplishments. Do you do you believe your effectiveness is happening fast enough or not fast enough? It's been incredible. When we started, uh, only one percent of the ocean was protected. Today, 7% of the ocean has been protected. It's been an incredible increase, yet it's not enough because the science is telling us that we need 30% of the ocean protected by 2030. So we need to quadruple the protected areas that we have now. Wow, that's, that's gonna be significant. And obviously you're gonna to have to fundraise some more money, but, uh, but you're under consideration for the MacArthur Award. Could you talk about that? Yes, uh, it's not just about money. Uh, we need good partnerships too. The good thing is that you know the last ten years we have partnered with more than 120 organizations around the world, from government agencies to local NGOs to to indigenous groups. And um, 
but for, we are, have committed to continue working for 10 more years. We want to see 30% of the ocean protected by 2030. So we have 10 more years of hard work. And for this, of course, gig, we will need more funding. So we were very lucky that uh, the MacArthur Foundation uh, named us as one of six finalists out of 755 proposals for a hundred million grant is the MacArthur Foundation's hundred and change program. So on April 7th, we will know who the winner is. We are the only environmental uh, project out of the six finalists. So um, we might uh, get a hundred million dollars from the MacArthur Foundation to contribute to, to these global ocean conservation efforts for the, for the next decade. So wish us luck. <laughs> Good luck with that one. That that would be that would be really terrific. So, what is next for you? Because obviously the world is under still under pandemic mode, but I'm I'm sure traveling on on a boat around the world is probably a lot safer than um, for us, right? If we were on a boat, but you know I've been in Washington D.C. for a year now, and I'm dying to go diving. So we hope that by the summer, when hopefully all of our team will be vaccinated. Uh, against COVID. Then in the fall, we hope to do the first expedition, you know, since the pandemic started. And hopefully, you know, next year we'll be able to resume our normal rate of work, which is you know, targeting four new locations every year. So four expeditions to, to these wonderful places every year. That sounds wonderful. So when viewers watch your documentary uh, later for this month, what is the one most important take that you hope that audiences would walk away with? I think the most important is that we are all connected. That without a healthy ocean, there can be no healthy humans. And also, I love to rekindle that, rekindle that, that sense of awe and wonder for the ocean that we all have when we are kids and that we lose when we become, you know, adults and citizens, right? So that, that, uh, that emotional link with the beauty and the wonder of the ocean, because it is not only the food and the air that we get from, from the ocean, it, there is also this uh, spiritual connection. It makes our lives so much richer. That is terrific. Well, Henri, hey, thank you for uh, speaking with me. I, it's it's been a pleasure. You're you're the second explorer that I spoke to uh, th this month. The other one was uh, Celine Cousteau. I think uh, uh, she's. The I love Celine. She's doing wonderful work. Yeah. So both both of you, all of you, are doing great, great work, and hopefully we could all uh, contribute to you know save this planet uh, as quickly as possible. Well, thank you so much for having me. Hey, thank you. Next time. Take care. Bye.